So I am Rebecca Moore, director of Somerville Manning Gallery. This is Vicki Manning, owner of Somerville Manning Gallery. And today we are joined by Greg Mort and John Mort, who both have an exhibition at the gallery titled Object Lessons at the moment. Um, and we are gonna hear a little bit about their process, their inspiration behind their work, and hopefully talk about a couple individual pieces. So Greg, John, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, thank you a lot, Rebecca, and of course, Vicki too. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, that we're both able to join you today. And I, uh, I usually uh, make a point of, of underlining how uh, continuously grateful uh, we are, I am, to, to the both of you and to the, the Somerville Manning team for your amazing work and your conscientious presentation and representation of, of artists uh, among whom I am very privileged to count myself, but it would be it would be pretty silly for me not to mention that under the circumstances, that's an especially appropriate uh, bit of gratitude to, to underline because the last few months have not just seen the, the tumult of the pandemic that everyone else is spiraling their way through <laughs> on on what they what they hope is a path of of progress, but um, that you've you've borne the uh, the unexpected changes of literal literal. Uh, natural disasters and come out uh, just just as poised, if not more so than ever, and, and committed to your your uh, representation of, of artists that you you really believe in. So I, I think that that that's the that's the starting off point in so many ways for Thank for you. me that, that your, your poise makes all this possible and, and it is appreciated a great deal. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Part of the part of the uh, the journey into a into a, a presentation like the like the show that we're that we're uh, having staged by you guys now is is that it begins with a title and uh, you're you're often very uh, cooperative and collaborative in coming up with that and um, the the jumping off point for for this collection was and often is for me the the title. Um, which is object lessons, as you were you were uh, kind enough to mention, and it it is uh, the the notion that there is sort of a there a kind of infinite uh, potential reverence for for the the natural world around us and for for the world around us. Period, and and that the power of and the rewards of observation. Of, of the world uh, show us a connectivity and show us a, a kind of um, through line if we're if we're willing to take the time to be open to that and to, to practice that uh, that material reverence that I that I uh, alluded to a, a moment ago it's it's telling and interesting that the two collections inspired by derive from that title uh, have have interesting things in common, but are also are also uh, standing on their own uh, in 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 their end in their end product. Well, I, it's very well said. Very well said, Son. I I think that uh, our work, although similar, is is different in a number of ways. Uh, partially because of the materials used. I. I have primarily been a watercolorist for my career, although there is an oil painting and a pastel painting in the show, but uh, um, Jonathan's work is, is um, in colored pencil, which uh, is quite a different material uh, in terms of uh, application and, and material. the material itself is just so different. It's not really like painting, uh, it's more akin to drawing. So, um, I've been really fascinated to witness his journey and his development, and uh, also very amazed. Uh, his his work is is one of those special areas where you you enjoy them from afar, but there there's such rewards when you get up close to the, to the pictures and and just to sort of uh, scrutinize the surface itself. It's it's really it's really marvelous. So it's been. Really fun for me to to watch his his whole development and and I uh, you know, you wonder how two artists who are not only related but what kind of work near each other you know how how you influence each other I think is is kind of a fascinating journey. 
Um, I, I noticed, uh, D Dad, in your in your pieces, there are many different representations of uh, tree leaves. Uh, there are tr trees at a variety of scales, and and also times of day. Um, could you could you talk a little bit about what inspires you to to reflect on the the quality of something that that is uh, in so many ways simple and and taken taken even for granted as a as a leaf? Yes, and I think I may have mentioned this to uh, to Vicky or or Rebecca that um, this time of year, the fall, is I, I really start to notice. Uh, leaves. Although one of the paintings uh, that shows the shows some very young um, oak leaves that are kind of a bright yellow green. So I, I enjoy the evolution of uh, nature in terms of seasons. Uh, and in the fall, I, I become sort of obsessed with uh, leaves coming down, and and you know they're they're sort of a bright color for a short period of time, and how quickly they change. It really. It's a powerful statement on uh, the passage of time, but also on the repetition of, of the seasons. You know, one of the one of the things that human beings love to uh, rejoice in is um, the renewed elements of of uh, nature, uh, but also the the sort of sleep time of nature in, in the winter. So I'm I've always been kind of drawn to that, um, and as you were mentioning this. this similarity in in um, our, our scrutiny, what we look at, I think that the world is such a busy place with so many um, tempting things to focus on. We sometimes forget the simpler objects that are around us. And yet in something like uh, a leaf or, or two leaves, uh, there's, there's such a, a, a power to it. Um, what we see on the screen now, just uh, two oak leaves. That are kind of half submerged in water, and it's um, you know they they really are animated. They're like they're like a pair of dancing individuals, and so there's so much to be seen in in sometimes uh, so little. It, it, but that's part of what I think both of us do is is sort of reveal that to the viewer that and say you know take a moment, look at this. And 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 kind of revel in in the awe of it. Uh, I think it's it's an important message to convey. I, I'm glad that you mentioned the uh, the significance and the quality of uh, of cycles and and something like the passage of of the seasons or or the days in your in your work because the piece that's on the screen now I, I think of as a, a an amazing sort of counterpoint to uh, one of the other pieces in the show, which is the the oak leaves that are on uh, the the backdrop of the night sky, the the very dark uh, background. And um, one of the fascinating things about uh, experiencing art, of course, as a viewer, which I get to be too, which is also really fun, um, is that you assign your own values and 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 journeys narratives to the work of other artists and and you uh, derive your your meaning your me meaning for yourself from the work and in seeing these two pictures this this one and the previous one in this show together and, and being created in uh in tandem i i was all too easily imagining the, the kind of different experiences of, of if you're outside on an autumn night and it's quite dark, you can hear the dry leaves, you know, quite quite beautifully. And, and it is a, a, a strange and, and a, a wonderful sound. Um, and to me, the, the painting of the, the oak leaves against the stars, it, it evokes that sort of a, a moment of, of sensing something that, that you know is near uh, or you know, but that you're not quite certain of in in, in its place above you, um, and then the wonderful stillness of the the very early light falling across the still oak leaves on the ground is both a revelation of of the the, the daylight, um, and and also the showing the the next step of the life of these leaves as they're now now they've parted from the branches and and now are on the ground. Um, so I, I think that even even details that fine are are uh, you know 
a wellspring of inspiration. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly that's something that I think that um, is among the lessons that, uh, however unconsciously, were were passed to me by example from my dad. If I uh, could mention that I, the, one of the similarities of our work is that we we kind of approach design from in some ways, uh, a musical angle. And now the, the, the two pictures that we've been looking at of the leaves, they, they have similarities in that the, re, the repeated shapes of them is part of what makes the, the, the pieces sing. And Jonathan's work also has a, has a rhythm to it and, and is even more, he's even more conscious of something like, like symmetry. Um, I, I find that the, the geometry, and maybe this is his architectural background, as well, the geometry of, of his pieces and symmetry of his pieces is part of what makes them so strong. Uh, his awareness of uh, circles within circles and and rectangles and, and and triangles, all these things are are really important in uh, the way the the viewer is stimulated by the activity of the design of the picture. And it makes it a very pleasing uh, picture to look at because of that, uh, in, in the way that, that a beautiful symphony kind of tickles that same part of the brain. So this is, this is something I think that uh, both of us have an awareness for. And if, if you really think about it, it's, um, you know, it goes way back to the sort of primitive part of the human brain that, that recognizes shapes um, and it's uh, part of survival, of course, but it's also part of what makes us feel good. The the piece uh, previously that has the the uh, the circular element in it uh, is is a thank you uh, thank you is a, is a, an example of uh, the the sort of layers uh, of of the experience that that my dad was just describing um, the. The human desire to interpret nature, which is something that that both <laughs> uh, my my father and I are are captive to, uh, is is in itself a topic of fascination for me. And so, if you see in the in the composition on the screen now, the the book, which is the the red the red and gold uh, piece at the the bottom there, it's the top of a of a, the spine of a book. Um, it depicts a thistle blossom. Um, now, of course, I, I found that book at a uh, at a bookshop, um, and felt felt instantly connected to this uh, because I too am fa I am, am am driven by this desire to interpret the natural world, and so the work of other creative people who who, who have done that, who have gone on that journey, is a is a limitless uh, limit limitless wellspring of of fascination for me and including those objects in my own uh, work my own drawings is is something that I come back to again and again um, in in part because of the the awareness that my my father was describing that there is this this very fundamental human need to if not bring order to the the world around us at least to interpret it on on terms that we understand um, it is it is very very much at the the root of the human experience of the world and and it's from that drive that something like a sense of beauty uh, comes to us when we see something that we understand to be rare we we assign value to that um, and uh, whether that's in the form of a, a beautiful uh, leaf or you know a particularly a uh, well well preserved shell um, we for for some reason we have a a, a very common uh, a fundamentally human desire to to try to understand how such a how such a special object could come to be i'd like to um, again speak of the not just the similarity, but the, the, the profound difference in, in approach. And, and although I guess if, 
generally speaking, we could say, well, you know, you're you're both more or less realist. Um, the way that we get to where we finally get to is so vastly different um, from from each other. That's that I think is really is a profound thing that you know you might not figure that or or be aware of that uh, in in just looking at the pieces in the show, but. Um, uh, Jonathan's vision, I think, is so much clearer from the get-go. Mine is mine is a little bit hazy, and and uh, it, it takes time for it to materialize. Um, and uh, also, the the materials themselves are so different. Watercolor in, inherently is transparent. Um, it's very very fluid. It, you can make it fabulously thin. Uh, it can be blended while it's still wet it can be you can let the the surface dry and then you can add other colors over it and if you're if you have the deft of hand you can not disturb the colors under it or if you then decide to disturb the colors underneath you can you can agitate it so these are some of the wonderful things about watercolor but this uh the beast that that jonathan deals with um uh, colored pencil is such a different vehicle. Um, and I think that, that anyone seeing the show should really should really also think about that, that the, the nature of the mediums is so vastly different, although things like design are the same and so forth and uh, sense of color are, are perhaps akin, but the process itself, it's important to remember how different the process is. Yeah, they, I, I... Uh, not being a an expert on psychology, I can only wonder at times if uh, the the preference for for mediums, uh, perhaps in all artists, is a reflection of of their own internal life. Um, and I uh, I like to think of myself as something of a precise person, um, and so the the very things that uh, that are often mentioned to me as, uh, well, well, that could, you know, isn't that kind of a drawback to, to something like colored pencil? Uh, you know, in my mind, I, I say to myself, well, but yeah, but that's the whole point. I mean, that you that you have to lay everything out with with considerable care before you begin, and that each phase has to be executed in a a, a certain order, and and that the the parts of of a drawing as they they come into being have to cooperate and be be mended together to uh, to be uh, manifest in their in their finished finished form. Uh, all of that uh, really calls to me in a way that that if I was if I was using something uh, like like oil paint or uh, or if I was a more abstract uh, uh, composer in terms of the the finished quality of the images that. That I would not get to experience in my in my creative process. It's uh, it's certainly not a statement of, of value. I I am often uh, I'm far more amazed by by something like my dad's work where he he really is uh, the, the the quality of improvisation in his execution is boggling to me because uh, that that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, th that is the equivalent creatively to me of riding a roller coaster with the bar up. <laughs> I can't, I can't imagine how, 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 you know, how it might feel to, 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 to ride such a, uh, you know, a, a, a bucking bronco. Uh, but he, he does it so beautifully, and and it, it engenders its own kind of expressiveness, and um, and leads him to to beautiful results. Um, but I, I think it's very wise to point out that we, we even in our, our discussions about the philosophy of creativity, even as we frequently uh, talk to each other about technical dilemmas um, in a given piece or in, in work overall, um, that there is this, this very different sort of uh, uh, material journey uh, in the in the media inherent in the media that we that we each each use you have really raised an interesting thought uh which has uh, bothered me for for many many years and that is 
Um, sometimes when you're working on a painting, believe it or not, or, or a piece of artwork, your mind is kind of in many places at, all at once. It's not, it's not focused uh, entirely on the, the small area that you're, that you're working on, let's say. Um, but one of the things that often crosses my mind, and I have no answer for it, and, and Jonathan sort of alluded to it, is that what is it in me, in my brain, or in my emotions, what is it that makes me work on any particular part of a piece at any particular moment? So I, I remember one time years ago, someone said, oh, I, I thought that you this person not really knowing much about, about artwork or painting. They said, I thought you would just start in the upper left-hand corner and kind of work towards the lower right-hand corner, <laughs> which, you know, in a very logical um, universe, that kind of, maybe that makes sense, but it's, no, the, the haphazardness that, that one um, attends to is, is quite bizarre and how you move around and all of a sudden you, you something in you, it, it tells you, go over here and, and put this down. So it's it's a very, very mysterious process. No, I was gonna say if now, can Vicki and I jump in and ask a couple of questions? Oh, please. please. Vicki, did you have a question for Greg? Uh, oh yeah, I have a couple, but although I was gonna comment on what you just said about how, you know, where, where you jump in on a painting. And I would think that part of that has to do with as you're working on it and you have an idea in your head, still it's it's unfolding underneath you with your eyes and your hand. And the designs are going to, um, again, unfold, develop. So you might need to go to some other area to heighten a color or a density or, you know, to continue to get to the vision that you see at the end. No, that's the, the very well, very well understood. And um, again, just speaking specifically about watercolor, I think one of the things that, that uh, years of experience teaches you is that there's, there's a quality to the way that the, the paint can be applied um, that has a randomness to it. And part of the trick of a successful watercolor painting is to realize that an accidental wonderful thing has happened and, and not to goof it up. So, the, and, and it is this kind of tight rope that you walk of, of control and no control. And uh, although, again, you, a viewer might look at them and, and think of the, of the paintings, the watercolor paintings as very controlled, but it really isn't that at all. It's, again, it's this kind of rolling the dice and, and being able to recognize when you, when you have, um, when something good happens and, and say, oh yeah, that, there you go. But I, I really, that wasn't part of the plan. You know, uh, um, uh, I'm speaking about things like, you know, the surface or the way two colors, like Vicki was saying, the way two colors work against each other. Um, you know, my, again, my, my approach is, is somewhat vague. So it's, you're kind of waiting and waiting for that surprise and, and, and hoping that you can, uh, come up with it successfully. So it's, it's, it really is kind of a, a hit or miss game. I have another question for you, Greg, before I yes. ask you, John, is that I remember some years ago when you were doing a show with us and um, I think I was writing something kind of forward for you, but we got into a conversation as John mentioned your interest in, um, in, in space, basically in astronomy and outer space. And you told me that all, all that we see on Earth from our is based on light, which comes from out of outer space. And I thought it was such an interesting perspective that you were taking it from the sun to the space to the light on Earth that then went into your paintings and how you looked at it. Um, is would you would you like to elaborate on that again or? Sure, sure. No, I, and, and the piece that's on the screen now, uh, which is titled um, Journey Work of the Stars, this is, uh, I was a, a kind of, uh, I was a big fan of Carl Sagan, and, and uh, he quoted Walt Whitman, uh, a poem, and, and in, in the poem, it, it says that uh, a blade of grass is the journey work of the stars. So um, what most people don't realize is that um, 
everything that we that we see, like you were mentioning, everything that we see um, came from the interiors of stars. So there's this deep connection to um, the evolution, uh, the evolutionary processes that take place in the universe um, that are responsible for our existence. Uh, so everything is really, in a way, connected to to stars. All the atoms in, in your body were generated um, in some long forgotten star uh, billions of years ago. They, that's where the heavier elements came from. Uh, from the interiors of stars. So we have this amazing connection to the universe itself. Um, also, as Carl Sagan said, we're, we're a way for the universe to know itself, which I think is a, is a pretty brilliant statement. If I may just add, add to that, because I, I know that um, this is something that we've, we've written, written about uh, to you guys and have, have talked about before, is, is that the for, for me, understanding that and, and seeing the example of that appreciation through my through my father, um, I I am always inevitably in the end reminded of the counterpoint to that, which is that uh, the 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 universe uh, to our understanding now will have a very long life, uh, most of which uh, during during most of which there will not be stars. Um, there'll be a, there'll be an era after which there aren't any more stars, and the, the life of the universe, where where there is something like light, which we can can sense and use to understand the the world around us, uh, compared to the the era of darkness that will come after that, it is it is infinitesimal, and so that is is in many ways the sort of the biggest the macro example of of the the source of of reverence. For for the world around us, uh, gen generated by and sensible because of of something like the stars. Well, along with the stars, what I was going to say is that I remember you talking about you know we live in blackness, and the only reason that it's not black is because of the reflected light coming out of the sun, and or coming from the sun, and that light coming to Earth is what enables all of us not only to see everything, colors, shapes, etc. But also, you know, a painter works with color and light in terms of a, a, a creation that is a, what, a facsimile of something they think or something they see. And again, this concept that it all comes back from the, from the universe, because that's where the light comes from. Sure. And, and on a larger sense of where we are, um, it's, the universe is, is predominantly dark. So I, I often joke to people, I say my, my favorite, nighttime is my favorite time of day, um, which, is, which is a little screwy. But um, you know, when, you, when you go out on a clear night and you look out, that's the real state of affairs. The illusion of, of the blue sky and, and the sort of limited uh, sense of, of that we're in this kind of soap bubble. Uh, is is it's a wonderful illusion, but it's you know we really are on this little lifeboat, and uh, it's a it's a big big empty. Um, it's so huge that it's impossible for anyone to even imagine how big it is. And um, our good fortune to be near a a stable star that doesn't do nasty things like burp like some stars do. Um, it's it's all very it's all very wonderful and, and life couldn't exist without without the sun. So um, these are things that we take for, that we take for granted. Uh, but um, it's amazing what human beings have figured out and and come to understand. And and that is one of the one of the uh, ways that your brain kind of wanders as you're as you're working. As as my my father mentioned uh, a little earlier in our discussion. You you are often surprised by where your 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 head will will kind of uh, stroll to an unexpected place uh, as you're sitting there working on a on a, a relatively finite area of 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 a of a painting or a drawing, and uh, for whatever reason, I, I find it pretty easy to get caught up in in the the amazement or the appreciation of of something like. Um, the idea that uh, our 
our world is in so many ways physically a paradise. Uh, and yet the universe is 99.9998% uh, uh, empty. <laughs> uh, not, you know, there's, no, there's nowhere in, in all of that uh, that life could exist as it does even on a, a planet like the Earth. Okay, um, I'm going to um, jump the starship here and uh, <laughs> head over to uh, <laughs> you know, a early. conversation with uh, John, where a story you were telling me about one of the paintings, I know that you are a ser very serious history slash presidential um, scholar, really, you, and uh, there is a painting that you did in the show uh, that referenced uh, the portrait of Dolly Madison and um, that is, would be a really fascinating story to, uh, to go over the way you told me. And well, I, I appreciate you, you mentioning that and, and the, the word scholar is pretty, is pretty lofty. Thank you for, for that high praise as well. Um, the, the, the piece that you're mentioning uh, is, uh, yes. Oh, there. Oh, there it is. Right over on the over on the left. There, um, the the piece is called "Painted Lady," and it is a uh, a drawing that I uh, composed as a still life, as you can see, uh, that includes a photograph of uh, the, the person we call Dolly Madison, who is the the wife of the fourth president, um, but uh, who who in her own right was a uh, commanding and uh, gracious uh, individual who was, who was uh, someone that I think of in, in many ways as the first American. And the, the composition uh, does, uh, does a, a sort of a, an homage to, to that idea. Of course, somebody like, like George Washington, you know, we, we think of for his prominence uh, and, and the importance of, of his leadership in, in the Revolutionary War, but he was 44 when the Declaration of Independence was signed. Dolly Madison was only 13. And so she really came of age in the years that followed, living in, in the city of Philadelphia, where she did, uh, where, where she grew up as, as the notion of, of the United States as an independent nation grew up. And so each object in the, the still life uh, is a reference to, uh, to that journey. The, the background piece is a, a book that's actually a bound copy of uh, George Washington's famed and often referenced farewell address. Um, and uh, the photograph is, is quite an amazing one when you consider that, that Dolly Madison was alive during the Revolutionary War. She was the first first lady to live to be photographed. Um, and yet uh, the title Painted Lady is, is a reference uh, on, on a number of levels. She quite famously watched through her telescope as the uh, British troops invaded and burned Washington DC block by block during the War of 1812 and oversaw the, or organized and oversaw the evacuation of the White House, including uh, a lot of vital government material and paperwork. And I think at least one original handwritten copy of the Constitution. Um, but she also saved a portrait by Charles Wilson Peel of George Washington. Um, and so I, I think that that is, is a testament uh, that, I, that I appreciate, that, that I, I take to heart and take personally, because across the gulf of, of time, and, and though her experience in the world was very different from mine, uh, I, can, I can know in my heart because of, of that, uh, that act in itself, that she appreciated the power of art. Well, I think that's a beautiful place to kind of wrap things up, John. That was great. I, um, unless there's anything else particular that you guys wanted to discuss, I just want to thank you both so much for, you know, sharing some of your thoughts about your work and everything and um, hope we can do it again soon sometime. Thank you. We, we thank you and appreciate you all a great deal. <laughs>